Dr. Ward is gonna join us uh, on endocrinology and bone health that uh, she referenced earlier uh, in the day. And this is where I know we may have some other questions. Uh, we will lay, leave time for questions at the end of these sessions. Um, it's too important, even when the sessions sometimes run a little longer than we anticipate, uh, to cut off the Q&A segment, because that's why you're here, to get your questions answered. And all of these people, by the way, are approachable individually. Uh, if you want to sit down and have a coffee with them, I think we have some fresh coffee coming, or it's already here, maybe. Um, and uh, so please feel free to do that. Dr. Ward. All right, great. Thanks so much. I am. I had trouble seeing over the podium to see my slides, I have to admit. So I'm, I'm stepping aside. So hello. Great. You know, honestly, hard to follow um, how hard it is being human with, you know, bones, isn't it? So I just really want to uh, thank Rhonda and Natalie for that wonderful talk. And uh, I learned a lot, actually, and it gives me a lot to think about as a physician and as a fellow human. So. So I've been charged with talking about endocrinology and bone health. And uh, in the, the hours leading up to this, I trimmed my slides back. So I think you're gonna um, you know, make up a little time here. So I just wanna give you a 50 foot view of this topic. These are my disclosures, which I stated earlier. I do work with sponsors with funds to my institution. So we're gonna talk about hormones, the endocrine system, and we're gonna talk about skeletal health. So the sphere is adrenal insufficiency, bone fragility, which we call osteoporosis, growth, puberty, and weight management and obesity. We talked about adrenal insufficiency already, so I'm not gonna say much, if anything, about that. And tomorrow, Dr. Ibarra is talking about weight management and obesity, so I'm not gonna say much about that at all. So I'll really focus on bone fragility, osteoporosis, fractures, and growth and puberty. I'd like to start by helping you understand that the dystrophinopathy the muscle weakness itself can cause bone fragility, irrespective of steroids. And that short stature is also a feature of the condition, irrespective of steroid therapy. And then the steroids or glucocorticoids augment the risk of having a fracture. They certainly exacerbate the short stature and they can cause, in addition, delayed puberty, adrenal insufficiency, and obesity. Now, everything I'm gonna tell you about from here forward is provided in these articles that Dr. Campbell referred to earlier. These are care considerations that have been developed by an international uh, panel of experts. I was on the endocrine and the bone health subcommittee. So these guidances are in print and are fueling what I'm talking about today. So first of all, when to refer a boy with Duchenne muscular dystrophy to an endocrinologist. And what is an endocrinologist? Well, we are physicians who are trained in growth and puberty and other aspects of health that are related to hormones. And bone health typically falls under the expertise of an endocrinologist, really simply because we have expertise in some of the factors that determine bone strength. And others also do bone health management. Sometimes the neurologists do this. In Canada, I can tell you that in pediatrics, at least it's usually an endocrinologist taking responsibility for bone health or osteoporosis management. So when should a boy with Duchenne be referred to an endocrinologist? So this is ideal. This is what I would love to see happen. I know that we can't always achieve this, but ideally a boy would be referred soon after diagnosis to an endocrinologist and no later than around the time of steroid initiation. And the reason for that is because a lot of what you're going to hear about today, we need to be tackling in an anticipatory fashion before things happen as opposed to later in the game. Now, this is not always easy to achieve, but I would like you to be having conversations with your neuromuscular physician about referral to an endocrinologist and trying to get that going sooner than later. What can you expect from the endocrine clinic first visit? Well, my priority with that very first visit of a family to me is just to establish the relationship, to say, we're on this journey with you. We're part of the care team. These are the things that we'll be taking care of. 
And that is my primary goal with that first visit is to understand the family, where they're at in their journey, and to share with them a little bit of information without overwhelming them. I think it's really important that we don't say too, too much in that first visit to overwhelm families that are already dealing with a lot. I certainly, as a physician, review the health history and examine the patient, of course. And then I do touch on the potential bone health and endocrine complications and their management, but again, without overwhelming the patient. So I will say, if you make that decision to go on steroids, and we support you in whatever decision you make, then we will work with you to take care of the growth and the puberty and the bone health aspects and be part of the care team that helps manage the adrenal suppression and guide you in the weight management. So that's the goal of that first visit is to just basically say, these are the aspects of the care where we've got you back, your back so that you don't have to worry about them. You collaborate with us. So that's the most important message with that first visit to the endocrinologist. We already talked about steroid dependence for anybody who's just coming to the webinar now. We talked about this in detail earlier, but if a boy or a loved one is on steroids for Duchenne, they are steroid dependent. They need stress dosing in cases of medical illness. And so you can uh, listen to the earlier webinar for more details with respect to that aspect. So what about bone health and osteoporosis? So first of all, what is osteoporosis? Well, osteoporosis is a reduction in bone mass that increases the risk of what's called a fragility fracture. I mean, anybody can fracture falling from a tree, but a fragility fracture is when you fall from a standing height or less at no more than a walking speed. So you fall, you know, tripping over the flowers in the carpet and you have a broken bone. And you can see what that looks like sort of schematically here where there's less bone, you can see cracks in the bone, you can see holes in the bone. There's just less bone there to support the individual's muscle um, function and mobility. We've done a lot of studies on vertebral fractures as a main manifestation of osteoporosis in boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We know that they can occur as early as six months after starting steroids and on average about two years after starting steroids. So let me just show you what I'm talking about. Vertebral fractures, spine fractures, those terms are synonymous. On the left, we have a boy, he's eight years of age, he's been recently diagnosed. He has started steroids. He comes to me for bone health monitoring. And the most important component of bone health monitoring is the spine x-ray. Someone asked me about bone density earlier. The spine x-ray is the fulcrum of the bone health evaluation. His spine looks very nice. The vertebral bodies should appear like little ice cubes all the way up the spine. He comes back a year later after being on steroids and one of the vertebral bodies, it's called T9, no longer looks like a perfect ice cube. It's slightly triangular. And you might say, well, that doesn't look like a very big deal. And yet this is a classic hallmark of osteoporosis, early stages. The bones in the back should not lose their ice cube appearance. And then if you do nothing and you don't give bone protection at that point, then things just progress. This is a montage from many years ago before we re really knew what we needed to do in this situation. And that's called the vertebral fracture cascade. The other issue is long bone fractures or even fractures at sites other than the spine that aren't long bones like hands and, and fingers. Femur fractures, the biggest bone in the body, are frequent in this condition because of the bone fragility and also because of the frequent falls. So fall prevention is a big part of the narrative. So let's just look at this bone here. Picture says a thousand words. On the left, in this boy, 13 years of age with Duchenne on steroids, I can see that the bone density is low. The bone appears too black, which means that it's the density is low, but I also see that the bone is narrow, it's gracile, it's thin, and that's because of the lack of muscle tug on bone, which normally increases the width of bone. So even beyond bone density, we have bone size issues which contribute to bone fragility. And that's important because the drugs we use to treat osteoporosis only target bone density. We don't yet have a drug that targets bone thickness and width. It is the myopathy-directed treatments that are going to achieve that. 
So this is just a little example of just how our knowledge has evolved over the years. So this is a patient who had a fracture of the tibia, the bone from the knee to the ankle at six years of age and went to orthopedics, had fracture management, appropriate fracture management. You don't want to cast unless you absolutely have to. You want to keep people uh, moving in the fracture setting, but he was appropriately managed and uh, did not have bone health or endocrine follow-up. And then seven years later came back and the spine is fully collapsed. All those vertebral bodies have gone from being ice cubes to being fully collapsed. And so this is advanced osteoporosis. We now understand that a single long bone fracture, just one fracture of the arm or the leg meets the criteria in the Duchenne setting, whether steroid treated or not, for osteoporosis and merits osteoporosis intervention. So we're treating boys now at a much, much younger age than we ever were before with bone protection therapy. And that's been the big change uh, in practice over the years. We talked earlier about the fat embolism syndrome when you have a fracture or a bone bruise after uh, a fall and you can have this respiratory distress and neurological deterioration. Um, that is uh, potentially life-threatening and certainly an emergency and steroid stress dosing is needed, et cetera, et cetera. And we talked about that extensively earlier for anyone who's just coming to the webinar now, uh, but this is a medical emergency that can occur after a fall uh, or just banging the elbow or the leg against the wall, a minor injury. Symptoms can start within about 72 hours and uh, as I said, this is an emergency that requires that sort of attention. What do we do to optimize bone health? Just conservatively, like just some of the basic things. Well, first of all, we do take care of nutrition and Dr. Campbell referred to that. We live in a Northern country. Pretty much everybody in the room probably needs a little bit of vitamin D and in Duchenne, there's no exception there. So most of my patients, if not all are on vitamin D. Usually the dose is about 1,000 to 3,000 IU per day. Steroids do increase the rate of vitamin D catabolism or breakdown. So in Duchenne, we often need to give doses more on the higher end. We do not routinely prescribe calcium unless the diet is deficient. Remember, dairy is an important source of calcium. The reason we don't just routinely put all the boys on steroids on calcium is because they already potentially have extra calcium going out through the kidneys into the urine because of the submobility. And we can exacerbate that if we give calcium supplementation. We do give it though, if the diet is deficient. So that's something you would work out with your doctor. We diagnose and treat delayed puberty as far as possible, which can have a modest effect on bone strength, not a large effect, but a modest effect. We do talk about over and underweight. So if you're heavier and you fall down, you're more likely to fracture. If you're lighter, if you're underweight, you may be undernourished and that can in fact impact bone strength. And then fall prevention. So I talk a lot about this in my clinic because I'm Canadian and we have a, you know long winters and lots of ice. And I talk to the caregivers as well about, as well about fall prevention. So not just the, the patients. I've had families where a caregiver has fallen carrying uh, a loved one with Duchenne. And then we have two injured individuals. And when a caregiver is injured, that has significant implications, doesn't it? So fall prevention in both caregivers and patients is important. Growth hormone is not routine, and I'm going to talk about that when I get to growth. So how do we monitor for osteoporosis in Duchenne? So around the time of diagnosis or no later than, than about the time of steroid initiation, we start doing yearly bone density tests, and someone asked me about bone densities. Now, if you don't have access to a bone density test, that's okay because the most important thing is the spine x-ray, because the moment I see that those ice cubes are starting to flatten, that's an indication for treatment. The bone density just gives us an overall idea of how the child is progressing. And then once we start bone protection therapy, we're looking for that bone density trajectory to uh, improve. And so you can see we do bone density at the hip, the total body and at the bottom, the spine. And we're looking for certain parameters to signal that the um, individual is starting to lose bone mass. But most important is the spine x-ray. It should be done at least 
every two years if you're on steroids. I do it every year. And that's the guidance in the literature every one to two years, a lateral spine x-ray from the side. If not on steroids, the spine x-ray is every two to three years. And we do those x-rays more often as we monitor if there's back pain or if the bone density goes down significantly at the spine. So we do the monitoring on the left. The moment there's those very early signs of vertebral collapse, we start treatment. Or if there's a long bone fracture, like I mentioned, we start treatment. We do not wait for two long bone fractures. We um, don't wait for five spine fractures. The very first signs we get the boys on treatment and we call it bone protection. It's very normal to need this. We normalize that in clinic and the vast majority of individuals, if they're being followed appropriately and monitored appropriately, will be on bone protection uh, in their um, time with us in the pediatric setting. So this is something that uh, I think is really important that we're treating patients at a younger and younger age. We use drugs called bisphosphonates. I don't know who decided to put SPH twice in one word. Uh, anyway, bisphosphonates. Um, and these are medications that stun what's called the osteoclast. So the osteoclast looks like a little Pac-Man cell and it breaks bone down. And these drugs stun the osteoclast so it can't break down bone anymore. And the drugs that fall in that category are pimidronate and zoledronic acid. They're both good. We use zoledronic acid in Duchenne most often because it's given just over one hour, whereas pimidronate is given over four hours. So we try to decrease the burden to families by using zoledronic acid. And I think most uh, individuals in Canada on a bisphosphonate for Duchenne would be on likely zoledronic acid would be, would be my sense. Uh, in Ottawa, where we have a, a research focus on bone health and both bone strength in Duchenne, we use a, another medication that also decreases the osteoclast ability to break down bone called denosumab. This is a subcutaneous in the skin injection, whereas zoledronic acid is intravenous. This is something that's under study and is going very well, but hasn't really filtered out yet to other centers. We're still uh, working with the families on this therapy, but it's very promising indeed, and has the advantage that it's in the skin as an injection instead of the bisphosphonates, zoledronic acid given intravenously. So intravenous zoledronic acid is given every six months, so it's not frequent, which is a good thing. And once growth is finished, you can just give it every year. This is the nature of bone protection therapy. With the first dose of zoledronic acid, most of the boys have what's called a flu-like reaction to the therapy. It's like an inflammatory response to the drug as the body's adapting to that, low-grade fever, aches and pains, tummy upset. And this starts the day after the infusion and lasts two to three days and can occur with second and third doses to a lesser extent in some cases. We support the boys getting their first dose of zoledronic acid by making sure they're well hydrated, by giving them anti-nausea medications, Tylenol or ibuprofen as prescribed. And we had a, a conversation about that earlier in terms of those choice is between the two extra steroid if the individuals develop fever um, and tummy upset and then a number to call if there's any concerns in the days after that first dose of zoledronic acid so what about growth in duchenne so let's just talk about that certainly we measure uh, standing height uh, during the ambulatory phase once Ambula ambulation is lost, we measure the ulna length from the tip of the elbow to the little bump that you have on the outside of the lower part of your wrist. And also we can do arm span. Did you know that your arm span is about the same as your height? So when I look at that, I think, oh my God, am I really that? <laughs> anyway, you try it. You get someone to measure your arm span and see you know, how, that, how that works for you. Anyway, the point is we have other ways of um, measuring uh, height once ambulation is lost. This is the curve on the left that shows that boys with Duchenne already are a little bit more petite compared to unaffected individuals of the same age. And then on the right, that's the weight curve that shows that even in the absence of steroids, there's a tendency to gain weight in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So that's 
just some background information. Now, once we start steroids, the growth does usually in most cases taper off and it does so slowly. At the beginning, you don't really notice it very much and then it just starts to taper off. And that is because the steroids are tickling the growth plate. Usually the growth hormone coming from the pituitary gland is fine. It's not a hormonal problem per se. It's really that the growth plate in the bones is being adversely affected by the steroids. And then over time, that growth chart just becomes more uh, dramatic, if you will, and there can even be growth arrest. And this is hard for the boys. This is hard for the families, and we hear about that. And the way we discuss it with the boys is that this is expected with steroids, that we understand it's difficult, that we know that they're benefiting in terms of their muscle from the steroids and that this is an expected uh, side effect. And we, we talk that through them uh, with them when they come to the visits, but we do appreciate that this is difficult for the boys to have this growth arrest. Now that blue line that you see, that's the bone age. So if you look at the far right little red point, the boy is 16 at his last height measurement. And then the little blue dot, his bone age is 10. So that's the maturation of the skeleton lagging behind. And again, it's the steroids, you know, holding that back. So this is a very typical growth curve that I see in my, in my clinic. And what about growth hormone therapy? I get asked that a lot. So this has been studied over the short term in boys with steroid treated Duchenne. The benefits of growth hormone therapy are marginal, meaning minimal. And there's potential for side effects like fluid building up around the brain. It's called benign intracranial hypertension, worsening of scoliosis, and some problems with glucose metabolism. It's also a subcutaneous injection six to seven days per week. So at the moment, we do not think that the evidence is convincing enough that the benefits of growth hormone outweigh the risks. So it is not something that's routinely offered. Sometimes families will really want to give a trial of growth hormone. In my experience, it doesn't work enough to merit six to seven times a week, a subcutaneous injection. So uh, this isn't something that's uh, indeed routine at all. And then finally, puberty. So what about puberty? So puberty, of course, is that process of physical maturation. And in boys, it's masculinization or virilization, as we call it in endocrine terms. Pubertal delay on steroids is frequent in Duchenne. Pubertal development is typically normal, not on steroids. So this is pretty much a steroid-treated phenomenon. The impact of delayed puberty in my experience and that of others is variable. I have some boys coming at 13, 14, expressing that they're concerned about their delayed puberty, about the lack of hair growth and beard, mustache, lack of deepening of the voice, concern that their voice is high, um, and others that just, they can be 16, 17, 18, and it's not bothering them at all. So it's quite uh, variable and something that I explore with them to understand where they benchmark. There can be functional impairment as a result of the delayed puberty because of a small phallus. So difficulties using urinals um, when they're standing, difficulty using condom catheters for long trips. So sometimes those problems can be a reason to start testosterone therapy. And it can be a difficult conversation for many boys. So that's why I like to meet the families and the boys early on so that they get to know me for years before we have to sit down and have that conversation about puberty. So if you can imagine you're a 13 year old boy and you've just met a female doctor and she's asking you about puberty, that's, that's gonna be a little awkward, right? So I really like to get to know the boys early so that we have time to get to know one another and I can sensitively just over time start to gauge the boy's sense of his self and his pubertal development. We usually start talking about a boy's puberty around 12, 13, although we'll gauge that depending on their cognitive development. Every boy's experience of their puberty is different, as I mentioned. Testosterone therapy can be used to kickstart puberty in boys who are wanting to have masculinization occurring at a more normal time, like 12 or 13 years, which is when it typically starts to happen for boys not on steroids. 
Some boys need testosterone just for two or three years to get them going. Some boys need testosterone throughout their pubertal years. And so we monitor that to determine the length of testosterone therapy that they might need. Testosterone can be given as a once monthly intramuscular injection, usually by the family doctor, although families can also learn to do that. Or there's an in the skin form that's given every two weeks. So yeah, we talk to them about how they're feeling about it. I do not push testosterone therapy. I just want to make sure that they know that of their care team, it's the endocrinologist, it's me that would bring that up and talk to them about it. So how do we evaluate puberty? This is where it gets even a little bit more sensitive because true puberty is represented by enlargement of the testicles. It's not just hair growth. Those little adrenal glands that I showed you earlier, they make male hormones that can give you some hair growth and masculinization, but that's not true puberty. And those adrenal hormones will not carry you through pubertal development. The signal to the testicles to grow comes from the brain and the steroids shut that down. So the only way to know if a boy is truly in puberty is to look at testicular volumes. We have this little orchidometer. And if you look at one, two, three in yellow, that's the size of the testes in a prepubertal boy. Once they hit four mLs, that's a sign a boy has started puberty. And then adult um, testicular volumes are 15 to 25 mLs, and there's variability in that. So the only way for us to really know if a boy is going into puberty on his own and doesn't need testosterone or needs a little bit of help is to measure the testicular volumes. Another reason to have a relationship with an endocrinologist well in advance of that kind of exam. Some boys are, you know, really uh, find this difficult. So I have started to purchase orchidometers to give the boys. I show them how to do a self-exam just by sort of showing them verbally and I send the orchidometer home with them and they do it at home and they come back and report. And that's something I think I'm gonna do more and more because I'm finding that that's really appreciated by the boys as you can well imagine. Now, weight management, I, you know, Dr. Ibarra is doing this. Um, would you like me just to stop here because of time, Rick? Thought, yeah, I can do it in less than five. I just want to say in terms of weight management, so on the right, that is the weight curve in red in boys with Duchenne not on steroids. So there's this tendency to, to gain weight in any case. Steroids drive hunger. So the weight gain of steroid exposure is very different than just regular weight gain. Steroid-driven weight gain is unique in that hunger drive. So you see the boys asking for more, asking for more. We don't want it to become something that the boys and the parents are sort of getting, uh, you know, butting heads over. And the other thing is that the weight distribution is different on steroids. We get this typical facial appearance with the plumpness in the cheeks. There's an accumulation of fat just above um, the below the base of the neck, above the spine, and there's a truncal uh, abdominal distribution of fat that's different than if someone is not on steroids and just eats too much. So if any of us go away and we just eat too much for a period of time, we just gain it everywhere, right? So the steroid-induced uh, weight gain is, is quite particular in that sense, in addition to that driving the appetite. This is what the typical weight curve can sometimes look like on steroids in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It just goes up and up and up. And as it goes up, it gets harder to rein in. So that early sign, that circled early sign there that the weight is starting to just trickle up in this six-year-old boy, comes back at seven, and he's starting to upwardly cross percentiles, that's the time we really need to be focusing on the weight gain. And in fact, the moment you start steroids, it's something to be thinking about with the families. Um, but, but difficult, right? Because food is everywhere and it's a lifestyle issue and, and very difficult for families. What are the consequences of excess weight gain in this setting? Loss of self-esteem, difficulty with transfers and lifts at home in the non-ambulatory phase, and then multiple medical comorbidities of weight gain. 
Now, families struggle with this, and they struggle with the burden of it. And I hear parents bring this to the table, and just, you know, there's, there's often a lot of guilt there, and this is not how we want the families to be thinking and feeling. Weight, being overweight is not a sensitive measure of lifestyle. When you're on steroids, you're just driven to gain weight. It's not a character flaw. It's not a lack of willpower. It's just a difficult situation. And so we take that approach with the families and say, look, these steroids are going to drive your child to be more hungry and we're going to work through it early so that we don't get into that real precipitous increase phase and we keep that weight gain in, in check as far as possible. This is where I'm, I'm going to just start to wind down because Dr. Ibarra will no doubt talk about all of this, but weight management involves mental health, nutrition, um, healthy sleep activities, and also you know, trying to manage screen time a little bit so kids aren't eating while they're, you know, on the screens and developing that sort of mindless eating behavior. So we do encourage, you know, meals as opposed to snacking throughout the day and engaging with a nutritionist early within that those first few months of steroid um, prescription, I think, is the time to get on board with a nutritionist and uh, start working uh, in that way. And then we focus on uh, self-confidence, mood and mental health, energy levels, and blood sugars, cholesterol, some of the monitoring, as opposed to just the weight itself, right? It really is more about how the uh, boy and the man is feeling about themselves as they uh, navigate on their journey. So that is bone and endocrine health in uh, 25 minutes or whatever that took. <laughs> Great <laughs> so job. Great I, job. I appreciate the interest in the topic. I think it's something that um, is gaining uh, more and more attention as we appreciate it's more and more of an issue for families. So try to find an endocrinologist. We are a huge country, but we're a small, tight-knit community. If you can't find an endocrinologist, contact me and we'll find you one to link up with. I, I'm grateful for my team and everyone involved in this space. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we're going to just take a minute, uh, if we can, Dr. Ward, for some questions. Uh, Rochelle, you have some online? Yeah, one question online here. Yeah. What age do bone density or spine x-ray tests start in Canada? Yeah, so we want them to start around the time of diagnosis and no later than steroid initiation. So it's early, right? So if the typical boy is diagnosed between four and six to seven years of age, then that bone health monitoring really should start around that time. And the outside of that for me would be like within one year of those health events, right? So try to do it as close to diagnosis or steroid initiation if it ekes out to a year later. I think that's still um, reasonable, but we wouldn't want it to go on any longer than that. Questions from the, uh, from the room? Yes. I'll just... Oh, Whoever gets there first. <laughs> Rochelle's much quicker than I. Just a short question. Uh, Diego has a big accident six years ago. A bike, uh, which accident? A big accident a big in a accident? In airplane, in a plane. Oh. Uh, he has broken all the ribs uh, from the back to the front, mm -hmm. totally broken. I'm sorry to hear and, that. And after that, he always have uh, still having some pain. Actually, he, he often say, hey, uh, when you lift me with the with lift, uh, I feel like if the, the ribs broken again, and it's painful for him. Uh, anyways, my question is, what is the best way to get a referral to an, an, endro uh, an specialist to, to get an appointment for Diego? Because mm -hmm. sometimes family doctors doesn't accept us as parents request to them to do a spinal x-rays or a bones density test and they didn't mm -hmm. but how which is the way to do so yeah because so we try it and we cannot yeah agree. so i can i can help you with that i think i i heard you from the the greater toronto region am, am i right yeah so the the individual that seeing uh, the physician that's seeing the uh, adults with duchenne muscular dystrophy is dr angela chung 
in the, at the Toronto Health Network. And you might not see precisely Angela, but she has a number of colleagues working in that clinic. And that's where the boys are transitioning from Blurview or Toronto Hospital for Sick Children. Um, and she, uh, she and her team are osteoporosis experts, no matter what kind of osteoporosis you have, whether it's postmenopausal osteoporosis or rare disease osteoporosis. So I can help you uh, with that. Be happy to do that. And two great more question. questions online. The first is, should vitamin K2 be added if taking high doses of vitamin D? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the, the evidence for the extent to which that will boost bone strength is not uh, substantial. So it, I must say, not something that we've been doing routinely. Um, at the same time, I don't think it's something that would in any way be, you know, adverse. So I wouldn't be opposed to it, but it's not sort of standard of care necessarily. Doesn't mean it shouldn't be, but it hasn't been studied well enough to, to make it to a standard of care type of recommendation. Perfect. Thank you. And this question might be for Dr. Yabar tomorrow, but what can be done if weight keeps increasing, even with a great diet? Would metformin or other drugs be helpful? Yeah, I expected that question. So basically what's being asked here is that is the following. When you start to gain weight, it's a snowball effect, right? You gain a little bit weight and then you gain more and more weight because the metabolism has changed and it just gets easier to gain weight once you've started to gain weight. And what's driving that in part is insulin levels and insulin resistance. And so the medications that, like metformin, for example, is an insulin sensitizer, if you will, that can help with that sort of pattern and bring about weight loss. And there's other medications as well that are insulin sensitizers that people are starting to ask about in this context. I think this is a, a very reasonable question and something that can be explored on an individual basis. And we have seen some uh, teenagers go on metformin. It does cause tummy upset, but there are other insulin sensitizers that might be reasonable in a teenage boy like over 12 that is having challenges with um, excessive weight gain. So that's a very good question. And sorry, last question, uh, Dr. Ward. Is there any effect on eyesight due to DMD or steroid treatment? Yeah, steroids can have an effect on, on eyes. They can increase the pressure of the eyes, um, cause cataracts, glaucoma. So this is something that needs to be surveyed as well as part of the steroid exposure um, with, with periodic ophthalmolo ophthalmologic examinations.